Uh, we're going to go through and just talk about like where uncertainty lies within life sim, uh, how you should consider it in terms of you know explaining your results to others, uh, and then just general uncertainty topics altogether. But you know when we talk about uncertainty, and those of you in the consequence class already saw a version of this, but you know sometimes we think of it as a spectrum of hey we, there are some things we know like facts, and there are some things that just take us completely by surprise. You know, there's no knowns, unknown unknowns, everything in between. Uh, we like to get more toward facts, uh, and sometimes we'll spend a great deal of effort, you know, getting more toward that in the spectrum, right? Like you may be able to go up there and do a paleo flood study to reduce your uncertainty around your frequency of flooding. Uh, sometimes they'll go out and do a survey of your structures to reduce your uncertainty around foundation heights and whatnot. There's lots of things you can do to reduce uncertainty, right? But there's sometimes it's just not going to be worth it. You know, we've talked about a lot of assumptions that we make in the model. It's like, what about this? It's like, yeah, that's a great idea, uh, but probably wouldn't change the overall results. So sometimes you won't really care to reduce that uncertainty. And sometimes you have to like prioritize how to reduce your uncertainty. Like, is it, do we get more bang for our buck doing that paleo study or a survey of our downstream homes? And that sort of, Knowledge can also just help guide your decision making, whereas like, hey, uh, they all have the same mean, but we're more certain about this project, maybe that become relevant. There's generally people talk about uncertainty as two different frameworks. There's epistemic uncertainty or knowledge uncertainty, inhibitory uncertainty or natural variability. So if I asked you, is it gonna rain tomorrow or a year from now, you know, you, you may have an idea, maybe you can go on Wikipedia and say, okay, it, it rains uh, one out of every 10 days in Sacramento, so there's a 10% chance that it's gonna rain next year, uh, if, you know, on average at least, right? But there's not much you can do to drive down that uncertainty. There's probably, you know, maybe you're a weather modeler or something like that, and you can shave that down to like 9% or 11%, but you're probably not gonna do too much better than that. If I asked you what is the ceiling height of this room we're in right now, uh, you guys, with enough effort, I imagine, can do a pretty good job of that, right? You know, maybe you'll get a ladder and a measuring tape or get some sort of laser pointer, and you could probably figure it out and tell me that, hey, this is a 22 foot high, any guesses, uh, ceiling height, and that would impact the life loss in this room if there was flooding by such degree. You know, we could, we could put that information into a model if we wanted to. That's reducible knowledge uncertainty. So where is uncertainty in a life sim? So some of this, uh, you know, we have uncertainty as literal parameters, like, hey, here's a probability function of whether or not people will enter a flooded roadway. And sometimes we have a truly uncertainty. There's like modeling potential areas for error, but we don't really capture in the model. But in general, you can see some of these uncertainties, right? You know, roadways, we don't really know what traffic conditions are gonna be like in any given day. Life sim doesn't preload traffic. Uh, we assume everyone is either at work or home or, you know, so, something along those lines when they started out and then they'll make their way out to their destination. But there's going to be uncertainty about, will emergency managers get out there and institute counter flow? Will they try to say, hey, both lanes of traffic are going this way. There's no north-south, it's all north. You know, we don't really know that for sure, what it's going to be like in some potential dam failure mode that could happen anywhere from today to 100 years from now or never. And so there's always going to be things that we just can't figure it out. But there's some things like population growth that we could do an investigation on. Like if we're interested in future flood risk, we could say, well, metropolitan areas this size and this trajectory usually grow at 10% a year. And so we can make a decent estimate if we wanted to on some of those sorts of things. But when we usually focus on uncertainty in life, and we look at some of these things, right? You know, where, how are people going to redistribute? We've already talked about Hey, we have uncertainty around our warning time. We have uncertainty around our protective action initiation rates. So we'll set up distributions for some of those key things, right? So uh, any questions about this general list or things you'd like to dig into in this list? Okay. So what's not built into LifeSim in terms of uncertainty? So H and H, we've kind of drilled down that, right? So it's always going to be two feet of depth at any particular structure if it's two feet of depth of that general iteration. You would have to somehow bring in another depth grid if you want to account for uncertainty, but as a model, it's only going to have that one grid. Every single iteration, you're going to have the same uh, depth of that structure. 
There's lots of other omitted sort of variables. There's no rescue uh, explicitly put into LifeSim. Uh, transient PAR is not explicitly put into the NSI. Uh, you can put in some of this information. Again, you can back into it if you wanted to. But there are things that are just not in there at all, let alone you know, measurements of your uncertainty about those estimates. So thinking about uncertainty, here's just another sort of breakdown. So natural availability, what are some examples of that? So exact location of where a breach would occur. You know, hey, maybe we have an idea that this is a failure mode that will impact the left embankment or the right, but we don't necessarily know where um, this will occur. That could be important if you have a very long dam or a very long levee. Uh, you know, maybe a breach of this location would have very different consequences than another. So sometimes it's important to breach locations and then put that information into your event tree. Again, if it's important enough to capture in your results. Number of structures that collapse. Hey, there's going to be some natural availability to that. We try to set up some, again, uncertainty bounds around there. I won't read through this entire list, but again, just on the knowledge uncertainty side of it, you know, where are the low spot levy? Hey, we can actually go find that, right? We can do LIDAR, we can do some sort of survey. We can go find where the low spot is and say, this is the most likely overtop of the location. And so maybe that will help drive some of our other analyses. So again, some things we can reduce, some things we can't. So of the things that we can at least measure, here's how LifeSim uh, tries to incorporate it. This is very, very small, isn't it? Uh, so you have in this particular example, foundation height, many different distributions you can choose from. Not that many, there's only like three in the list, but triangular distribution, normal distribution is going to be the most common one. Uh, and so if you have some idea of, hey, in my area, foundation heights are usually zero to three feet, most likely 1.5, you can set that up fairly easy if you wanted to, and that can help uh, put in some uncertainty in your results. There's also going to be uncertainty in the valuation of home. We kind of talked about this earlier. Triangle normal, again, same options. If you have uncertainty in your depth damage curve that you want to try to incorporate, again, by default, most occupancy types just have that deterministic function. You can add it in there if you want to get into it. So for life loss purposes, um, you know, we talked about generally uh, foot below the ceiling becomes a very important threshold for a lot of life loss estimates. But you know, we don't know that for sure. So you can set up distributions for all these sorts of parameters uh, to see if it really does make sense. Or again, you know, for ceiling height and things like that. So here's a stability function example. So we can set up uncertainty around you know, how we're sampling this curve. So right there, you're seeing a uniform distribution, it looks like. So we're going to give equal weight to each part of this curve. Uh, it doesn't have to be the case. If we have most likely, we could add it and make a triangular distribution. But we're still going to be sampling just this one curve, right? I mean, we are talking earlier, there's a case study where is it a wood frame or is it masonry, which is more appropriate? Uh, there's no ability to say, well, sample the masonry curve 50% of the time and the wood frame 50% of the time. If you want to do something like that, you would have to, uh, again, either run a sensitivity scenario like they did in the previous case study or set up some sort of combined curve where it's like, okay, I'm going to take the min from one and the max from the other and use the most likely I'll average them or something. You know, those are ways you, you can, again, kind of try to back into this if it's important for your study. So here's for warning issuance. Again, so the default curve is going to be this Lindell distribution, this high peak early on, and this very long tail. You think, okay, uh, I like to how this peak looks, but I'm not happy with this very long tail. You can put in a triangular distribution instead. Uh, you know, if this is fully customizable is what we're trying to get across for whatever assumptions you want to use. And if you're getting like very high life loss in some particular iteration, maybe look and see what's being sampled. Maybe it's the fact that you're sampling something like it's 360 minutes out like that. And maybe that's reasonable. Maybe it should allow for that much uncertainty, or maybe you're looking at a scenario like uh, hey, we're looking at an overtopping scenario. We know that we're going to have a combined emergency operations center. There's no way we would have that much communication delay in that sort of scenario. Or, hey, we know this is an earthquake scenario, and maybe we, you know they haven't spoken together in months since that is per per perfectly reasonable that you would have that level of delay. Warning, same thing. I think you guys just did a scenario where you have triangle distribution, but uniform, normal, all options as well as PERT distribution very recently, my favorite. And this is what's being used for the PAI defaults right now. Uh, this will give extra weight to that most likely scenario as opposed to triangular distribution where they all essentially get equal weight. 
Um, again, you know, basically you want to be able to have these wide distributions oftentimes where I'm pretty uncertain about what the evacuation rate is going to be. Uh, you know, maybe it'll be 100%, maybe it'll be 80%. I think 95 is pretty likely, but I want to keep those wide tails. The part distribution, normal distribution can be appropriate in those sorts of cases. Uh, you can also just use it for your evacuation or uh, hazard initiation, uncertainty, communication delay, uh, all over the place, basically. You know, Woody's done a great job of, like, we don't know many of these things for certain. Let's have uncertain distributions where we don't, really don't know. Most of these fields allow you to have an uncertain distribution in there. This is human stability, all that. So, again, uh, lots of uncertainty about the key elements. Really focus on evacuation effectiveness. That's where you see the biggest real swings, right? You know, you could have 100,000 people, but if they evacuate at 99% evacuation rates, okay, now you have the orders of magnitude fewer life loss than if they all just sat there. So that's oftentimes where you'll see the most uncertainty, and that's where most of these distributions are kind of focused. Monte Carlo, we just kind of talked about it. You know, I assume most of you are generally familiar with it, so. Random dull rolls of dice happening for every single one of these different assumptions, all being uh, combined across potentially thousands of iterations, however many you set up. A uh, great way to kind of mix and match. But it's important to know that, okay, yes, with enough iterations, we can converge and get a really good estimate of our mean. Uh, but what about, I forget if this comes in a later slide, you know, is there any correlation uh, in error among these different assumptions? There's none being assumed in life sim. Some may exist in your own model. Examples later. But basically, for any particular iteration, you're going to choose a value from this curve and say, well, this is what's being used for this particular die roll, right? So this person, they're not going to use the whole curve for any particular evacuation. They're going to say, I'm going to use that one, and this other evacuee will use this dot over there if they're in a high clearance vehicle in that example. Same thing with structured um, damage. You know, you're gonna, in any particular dialogue, gonna be using a curve that's being interpolated between whatever distribution you feed into it. So, correlation, here's where we get into it. So you can see in a lot of your plots whether or not you have a high or low correlation just by I, you know, there's no R squared or anything being offered for these sorts of things. But correlation definitely matters. Um, but it's important to know that there's no explicit assumption about correlation, uh, like between different, you know, if you set up your evacuation groups, your EPZs, you know, one county can roll up very high, very low evacuation rate. So that could kind of muddle your results in certain cases. So be very careful about how you set up some of those things and how you break it down. You know, is the county the appropriate way to use an EPZ? If you have 30 counties in your study area, you're probably going to cancel out a lot of your highs and lows, maybe to an unrealistic extent, right? Because sometimes you'll have a case where they all have a shared media or they all have a shared warning message. And so there should be some correlation in what those evacuation rates could be. So it might be more important in some of those cases to merge them into a single EPZ, and then you'll have wider swings in your uncertainty that's really more accurate. So identifying what's important, this is, I think, a little bit of a game you just played in your last scenario. So you can just think about it, but also these plots are really helpful to see what matters. So knowing nothing about where this plot came from, you know, what dam it is, what city it is, what could we probably glean from this plot right here? In terms of the population and how it relates to the dam, I guess, you will assign to go off of. Do we see a height correlation in this example? No, so warning doesn't seem to matter here. Why would that be? It's not too much of a trick question. So what? It's pretty short. It could be that they're, they're so close that this isn't enough time to evacuate. Maybe they have a really slow warning. It's either going to be that or probably more likely they're extremely far downstream where it doesn't really matter whether they get three hours of advance warning or zero hours of advance warning, right? They probably have 20, 24 hours of advance warning, so warning itself just doesn't matter. So if that is the case, let's assume this is the same damn project. What is this graph telling us here? 
So what? Yeah, so, so I mean, in Lord Layton's terms, A, if warning doesn't matter, it's the evacuation rate that's going to be. If they're all getting warned, it's just a matter of will they actually comply. So what is this telling us? What does zero mean? What does one mean? Yeah, and, and I mean that that's a general thing because so we can see like hey, at zero, very few people are evacuating. But if that literally is doing it's rolling at the very bottom. That's going to be sampling the min of whatever curve you provided there. If you roll one, you're sampling the max of whatever curve was brought, whatever distribution was provided. So this is a little bit confusing because in here we're being very literal of saying hey, it's either three hours before or 0.5 hours after. Here we're saying this isn't your evacuation rate, this is actually the die roll that was done. You know, sampling between 0 and 1. 1 could be, you know, whatever the max is, and that max is going to vary based on whatever assumptions you guys put in there. So this is that example. So again, if you rolled a 1, you'd be at that top curve right there. These are actually the old PII curves, but it serves for that purpose. So what's going on here? Yeah, I mean, so warning issuance relative to and hazard, you're going to go back to, what is this, 100 minutes beforehand? It's minutes down there. So warning kind of matters. It's the wide dispersed life loss if you're going out around 100 minutes beforehand. But by the time you get around to 20 or zero minutes, it doesn't matter anymore. So probably here, everyone's being caught. You know, it doesn't really matter whether warning goes out at breach or 60 minutes after breach, they're stuck. So here's another plot. You can kind of break it down. This, you know, here this is showing what um, whether or not you're in different uh, EPZs, breaking down various different ways to say, okay, here's how life loss will uh, vary group to group. Same sort of thing. You can come in here. I'm going backwards now. So uncertainty bounds, there's a few different plots you can play around in. Most common is going to be this day and night sort of thing. No, it's both day, uh, minimal and ample warning. So you can kind of see, okay, with my ample warning scenario, life loss comes down. Most of my box is much lower than in the other case. Very simple way to show how much does warning matter um, by just constraining the distributions and showing those different distributions side by side. Another sort of plot in here. Um, it's important to know you can right click on a lot of these iterations and see uh, if you're looking at a particular uh, scenario, what assumptions were used when I was talking about like, oh, if you click on the one side of the PAI curve, it's using the top. It'll actually show you what curve is being used if you click on those dots. Uh, sometimes if you go to the right uh, field, you can also right click and say, oh, generate a particular iteration for me. And then you can actually look at that iterations evacuation process and whatnot if you want to see detailed outputs for a particular iteration. So I won't go through all of these, but different correlations can come out for um, different scenarios. Here we go. So uncertainty bounds in general, um, you know, we've seen some case studies where we're saying, here's our uncertainty plot that we've had, um, observed life losses over here. I'll try to make the point that you should be Uh, which is like what we're saying here, that there's literally a 0% chance that, you know, whatever this is, uh, 10 life loss or lower could happen. If, if something that you say has a 0% ch chance of happening happens, that's bad. If something you say has a 100% chance of happening does not happen, that's bad. So we should try to be humble with a lot of our uncertainty. We should try generally to have fairly wide uncertainty bounds unless you know. I mean, ideally you want to have a very specific answer and say, well, I think exactly 72 life loss would happen. However, in our line of work, that's going to be very challenging to do. So I'd say, in general, I feel like you should probably have fairly wide uncertainty bounds unless you have a great reason to do otherwise. So these validation studies can be very useful in helping us get calibrated, right? We want to have tight bounds as, as we can possibly have while still being accurate. So the sensitivity analyses can also be kind of helpful in that way. If there's a parameter that doesn't have an actual distribution, like some of these 
uh, you know, like the breakdown between high and low clearance vehicles. You can go in there and play with it and do, I'm going to do a sensitivity analysis and instead of saying it's 50-50, I'm going to make it 90-10. Does that matter? Okay, yeah, it does impact life loss, so I'm going to go actually do some research about my study area and change those percentages. Or no, it doesn't matter, even though I made that very severe adjustment, so I don't have to worry about it anymore. So you guys have already played around with a little bit, lots of different ways to view your results, total life loss, life loss on roads, life loss on structures, et cetera, looking at the different mobilization rates. That's a great way to do QC on your model. Like, you know, uh, look at how many people actually evacuate it in your area. It's only saying 50% of my people evacuate it. That doesn't really make sense. They're all downstream. Why is that happening? Oh, crap, they're all getting flooded in the reservoir. You know, whatever it is. Um, great way to do just basic QC on some of your outputs here. Iteration plot, this is kind of what I was talking about earlier. You can click on a particular iteration, generate a detailed output, look at individual traffic flows, what destination they're going to, um, how long it's taking to complete evacuation, you know, break down a histogram of all the different evacuation times. So in this case, it looks like most of the evacuation taking just zero to five minutes. Or just looking at uh, tables of results where you can say, Hey, I had reporting areas by county, or I had reporting areas by miles downstream of the dam. I want to view life loss for that particular reporting area. So you can set up EPZs that have all your assumptions about evacuation rates and things like that. Uh, but you can have an entirely separate reporting area if you want to say, I want to look at zero to three miles below the dam, three to seven, seven to 15, et cetera. That can really help you kind of break down results. You can set up multiple different reporting areas. I want to buy political boundary and physical distance. I want to buy arrival time. Whatever you want, you can kind of supply it as a polygon, and then it will report out the summations. Uh, I don't know how much more we need to gather. We've got to get Jesse on the mic. Basically, lots of different tables to play around with. Uh, you come in here. You must have already done this in the previous thing. Reporting out uh, by roadways. You know, there's a question in the last sort of thing of where the life loss occur. You know, in a map window, you can not only report out structure summary results, but road summaries. Again, a great way to do QC. If you see 6,000 life loss happening on a single roadway, chances are you messed something up, and you should go in there and fix that roadway. So structure level results, similar sort of thing. Go in there, look at your high-level scenarios. You already did the generating summary results in your first example, so we don't have to spend too much on here. So again, well, how, why does this matter? This is when you start to get concerned, right? So SQRA, I think life loss is between 10 and 100, but there's a chance it could be 100 to 1,000. And that 100 to 1,000 is riding our total risk guidelines. This might become important. Like maybe you should do some sensitive analyses or additional investigations to say, is this plausible? Um, if not, we're over here, and maybe we don't have to do any further risk reduction to our project. But if you can rule out this, uh, then you can potentially move forward. So, you know, if it's riding the line, uh, this is when you probably need to spend extra effort on determining how confident I am with my consequences. Is there any additional study I, I can do to move this one way or another? Or are we good where we're sitting? Um, same thing, I mean, if you're more used to the engineering sort of thing, then this is probably where you spend a lot of your time. Like, oh, how confident am I about the frequencies? Uh, likewise with consequences. All right, so using this, basically all these plots help you tell the story, right? My dam is, the, dam, the risk in my dam is being driven by evacuation rate uncertainty. It's not warning issuance. Um, we need to focus on getting people to comply with evacuation. That could be a powerful story to tell. That could be a powerful story to tell the local emergency management agencies of saying, hey, how you phrase the warning message could have a huge impact on life loss. Or, you know, hey, uh, warning is so important that we need to do a great job about putting in triggers for when we issue evacuations, right? How sensitive your model is to some of these different parameters could help you know what risk mitigation measures might be possible can help you know where to spend time on reducing uncertainty and then ultimately plotting it in the right place on your chart and making correct uh, decision making. So any questions about, well, let's do this. Well, let's do questions first and then we'll check on learning. You got anything? 
complete certainty about uncertainty. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. For the different distributions of infrastructure that we have, is there any paper guidance before that the series judgment the distribution like different type of labels or yeah, so we mentioned before that a lot of our work on warning and evacuation is that, is that the sort of assumptions um, where we get those from, right? So doctors Maletti and Sorensen provided us three or four different research papers that kind of summarize the hazards research on how warnings are issued and how people respond to warnings. And that underpins the curve generator we use. Um, we're about to publish a revision to that work that I completed uh, that will further discuss how to use the curve generator for effective action initiation, particularly. But the basic idea is, you know, we went through the scoring sheet of saying, hey, messaging really matters for protective action initiation and an interview schedule, which is also available. So do an interview with local emergency manager agencies saying, are they following best practices would give you an idea of how good the messaging is. And then my revision kind of focuses on the contextual piece of like, are people immediately below the dam? Would they perceive that their life loss or that their life is at serious risk? Or would they perceive that this is gonna be more of a nuisance flooding and I don't really need to evacuate. That is also being wrapped into the curve generator now. So the curve generator can kind of help you come up with custom curves. Uh, but there's also some general rules of thumb of like, I think this is a low preparedness community or high preparedness community. And I think this is a, a place where people are likely to perceive very high risk or they're more likely to think this is going to be more of a nuisance than something they really need to fear and run for the lives for. Does that kind of make sense? So there's some papers that should be published, I believe, on the RMC's website now and another one that I know is forthcoming within the next few weeks. Any other questions? Check on learning. So which of the following can be modeled with uncertainty in LISA? Did I hear all of them? Except for C. Yeah, so human stability, yes, we saw that distribution. Willingness to enter a flood roadway, we saw that distribution. Max depth and velocity is the only thing that's not being pulled directly within LISA. You can load in different grids that have their own certainty built in uh, will have the ability to sample depths and velocities on a curve and everything, but not explicitly brought in. PAI, yes. Understanding the uncertainties your model is an iterative process and essential to risk-informed decision-making. True or false? Yes. True. 